Com- Com- the Accomplice Podcast. Conscious as. Con- con- conscious as. What do black folks want from their accomplices? When you hear the term ally, it's, it's a buzzword, right? And ally comes with convenience. You can't really help me if you don't respect me. You need to find out my struggle and not have a savior complex. How can you as a white person speak up? Hey everybody, welcome to the show. This is the Accomplice Podcast and I am your host, The Other Brother. You can follow me uh, at I am the other brother on IG. And uh, of course, here on the Accomplice Podcast, coming to you, bringing you uh, enlightening information and fantastic guests each and every week, talking to you about what it means to be an accomplice, uh, what it what it, it is involving being an accomplice. We we talked about this in the opening episode a little bit in depth, uh, but just want to kind of remind you, you know, that that what this show is about is taking things further in terms of. Uh, advocacy and support for the black community. It's not enough just to be an ally or a supporter, to be standing on the sidelines watching things go on and say, oh, you know, isn't that terrible? That shouldn't be that way. No, we have to be in the game. We can't be on the sideline. And so that's what being an accomplice is all about. And today, my guest is nothing other than my good friend, L. David Stewart. He uh, hails from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, trained as an architect, evolved into photographer, designer, and educator, and uh, he is uh, multidisciplined, uh, just all-encompassing entrepreneur. And on top of that, if that all wasn't enough, he's also a PhD student getting ready to defend his dissertation soon. So, uh, David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Brother Wood. Greatly and humbly appreciate it. Man, it's good to see you. You know, um, we're going to just dive right into this thing, man. Uh, you know, we've known each other for, for a while, and um, I think that, you know, we've had some conversations in and around this this topic, but uh, today, man, it's, it's you know, diving in a little bit deeper, and, and we're going get, to get our hands dirty in and around this topic of what do black folks want from their accomplices? Or, and, and maybe we need to even start with, you know, sort of along the lines of, of is this even a thing? Is this something that, that you know, people of other ethnicities, uh, particularly uh, of white or European backgrounds, should even be involved in? Um, so I, I want to start it off like this, man. Um, do you believe that white people should work with the black community in order to create tangible change uh, with regard to issues like anti-black racism, police brutality, systemic oppression, that kind of thing. Uh, so in other words, you know, should a white person be an accomplice? Okay. I'm going to take a very circuitous route to that answer. <clears throat> I'm going to start off with a definition of the word accomplice according to dictionary.com. A person who knowingly helps another in a crime or wrongdoing, often as a subordinate. So language-wise, we have to be careful using the term accomplice because it's a negative uh, assumption to the word. Although the root word of accomplice is based in being a partner. So as I reframe this to say, should white people be a partner to black people? Yes. My basis for saying that also is that in order to be a partner to someone or a brother, you almost got to meet like on a level, meaning we have to be level in our understandings. A lot of times, as referenced before, when you hear the term ally, it's it's a buzzword, right? And ally comes with convenience. Um, so it's like, okay, I'm your ally as long as it's convenient to me. I think one of the things that we're scared to have a hard conversation about when we talk about white people helping black people or just other ethnicities helping other people is what does that mean to help part of that helping in my personal opinion is first a basic understanding of empathy what is your struggle i can't you know when you need to find out my struggle and not have a savior complex oftentimes we see people who mean well that want to come in and help 
the disproportionate black kids or the narrative. The first thing is meet the person where they are at. You know, oftentimes the the helping of other people is at the cost of the person who's being helped their humanity. And what I mean by that is, oh, I'm going to come in and help the lowly little urban people or that is great. And you know what? I'm going to go back to my little tower and then life is great. First, you can't really help me if you don't respect me as a human. Number two, you have to really take the time to listen. Um, I think that in the climate that we live in, in this hyper politically correct environment, no one wants to offend people. And believe it or not, this goes both ways. I think if we're going to help each other, we need to have tough conversations. I think a lot of people want to white people want to ask black people things, but they're scared of the reaction. And I liken it to the Dave Chappelle show when it was like, ask a black person with the late, great Paul Mooney. As funny as it was, it's a lot of truth to that because there are questions that we can't help each other until we can really ask each other honest questions. Um, And then, you know, so going to recount, you know, there's a step of empathy and then asking questions because the other thing that is missed in this is, um, and this scares some people, black people are not a monolith. (laughs) <laughs> there are black people that don't like fried chicken. There are black people that don't like rap. <laughs> there are black people that have no rhythm. I know a few of them. So helping black people in itself is a very slippery and generalized term. And and I say that with humor, but if anyone wants to really understand what I mean in context, look at the diaspora. For the uninitiated, the, the diaspora is those Africans who were... Um, forcibly migrated because everyone likes to use safe language. Those are black folks taken and then dropped off at different points over in North, Central, and South America. So help to a North American black person that was raised in the North, like myself, may be different from someone in the South, which may be different from someone from the Virgin Islands, which may be different from someone in South America. So I said I was taking a circuitous answer for this very purpose. All of those things are very important to see what does that person need versus saying, I'm going to help black people because black people are very different. You know, you may speak to someone from a country like for the sake of example, a Dominican or a Haitian or a Jamaican that may not identify themselves as the term black. Now you've opened another slippery slope. Now the ally is trying to ally the ally and trying to understand, well, I was just trying to help black people. Now, what, you're trying to lump us all together? So you see how easy this is to get to just offend somebody. So to recap, understand what it is you're trying to do. Empathize, have a specific conversation, and then see how you can find how you can help individually within a specific context. And and, and this is why very shortly this man will receive his PhD because his his entire dissertation was, I think, just... uh, you know, sort of paraphrased in the last couple minutes here on this show. No, but in all seriousness, man, I, I, I love it, brother. And, and you know, always a pleasure to work with you and to talk with you because I always learn things circumtuitous. I'm, I'm, I'm going to find a way to drop that on somebody in a conversation. I, I, no, I, ser- in all seriousness, though, um, let, let's kind of go back and just, just sort of recap just a little bit before we, we go to a break here. But... Um, Starting off with, you know, sort of your definition and and this this connotation and yeah, we we created the show and the and the accomplice podcast on purpose to 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 sort of get people's attention, obviously, but it really uh, brings you know us to that point of saying we're we're together, we're we're you know connected, and it's kind of like you know the captain goes down with the ship. I mean. If, if if one goes down, we all go down, and I think that's kind of the attitude that we have to take in in this current environment. Because what we've seen thus far, I mean, we can legislate change, um, we can get people elected. I mean, it was you know great to see Barack Obama in the White House for eight years, but that does not constitute a post racial society, whatever that term's supposed to mean in, <laughs> at this point. Um, Things like that. So, and then to your point, we we had a show earlier in the series where we talked to brothers of uh, of the diaspora from different places, from from Canada, from the United States, from the Caribbean, and and one brother who actually you know migrated 
from Kenya as a, as a young man to Canada. So has, has lived in, on the continent and then moved to North America, right? So uh, to lump people all together, as you, you pointed out, into one homogenous group is, is really, um, you know, a, a, a misunderstanding of, of what the needs are of people in various communities as we, we look around uh, not only the Americas, but around the globe. And I think uh, the other point that I really want to want to hone in on what you said is, is that you were touching on this idea that that we have to get to know people as as human beings, as really, I think, individuals. And I think that's been the premise, like even for myself over the years to understand that when we when we approach the issues that go on in communities uh, with these broad sweeping br brushes, it's it's very much akin to the same kind of generalization um, that that it, you know takes on a negative context, right? Uh, when when you look at a particular group of people and say, oh well, all these this group of people is all the same; they all are like that. Uh, we we can't do that, and we can't really affect real change, I believe, until we really get down on the granular level, on the individual level, and we get to know people. And, and understand the folks that are in our respective communities. And so, uh, man, I appreciate that so much. Right now, uh, I'm gonna take us to the break. It is time for our song of the week. Here he is, folks. He is our musical director, The Ambassador. Yes, all right, so let's get to it. No time for fighting, no racialism, no partialism, no radical behavior. You don't know we is one under the Lord and the Savior. Check this heights. Yo, hey. My father is in Lucian. My grandfather is Spanish. All hold me. All right, all right. So as you know, whenever I play a song, there's usually a story behind it. So the song is called One Family by Bungie Garland. It's from Trinidad and Tobago. And the genre of this song is soca. So this song was released in 2004 for Trinidad Carnival, part of the soca genre, as I said before. And soca originated from the islands of Trinidad and Tobago, and it evolved from the combining of Afro-Caribbean rhythms with Indo-Caribbean rhythms, and as well was influenced by American soul. So we saw the evolution, now it's the predominant music in Trinidad for their carnival and actually spread throughout the Caribbean. This particular artist, Bungie, is heavily involved in that scene and this particular song that he's speaking of speaks to the multiracial community that's in Trinidad and Tobago. They've been this way for generations with Africans, Indians, Portuguese, Chinese, and essentially what he's saying is throughout the years they have, despite having these differences, they have a common culture, common understanding and relatability. So when he's speaking about, we speak the same language me and my indian partners are rolling down the road they're saying hey we live together we work together so i figured that this song was meaningful regarding the discussion we're having right now as it relates to being an accomplice and really having the understanding and working together despite our diversity despite our differences to come to a common cause That's why he is the ambassador, because he brings it to us each and every week. And, of course, uh, you know, you can follow him on IG as well and, uh, and on Twitch. Look out for uh, the Fets. I mean, this brother is bringing you uh, soca, reggae, Afrobeats, and, uh, and so much more. And there's always some history. There's always uh, something that you can learn from the music. Uh, and, and from what he, he represents. And of course, uh, right here on the Accomplice podcast, uh, we, we bring him to you each and every show. We'll have the ambassador back shortly, but right now, let's get back to my guest, the one and only L. David Stewart, my main man from Chicago. Um, so, brother, you know, we were talking about what it means to be a, an accomplice, and we, we kind of explored uh, the, the concept a little bit in, in the first uh, segment there. I want to go a little bit deeper into this discussion with you and and what i'd like to know from from your perspective and again you, you know i want to remind people of something you said in the first segment is that um 
one one person is not necessarily representative of an entire ethnicity of people, right? Uh, one person is not the spokesperson. I think a lot of times what I've heard over the years is a lot of, of black folks say, hey, I, I don't want to be the token person or the spokesperson uh, or that individual. I, I have my own ideas, my own thoughts and views and experiences and all of that. Regard me as, a, as an individual, as a, as, a, as a person with my own individuality and uniqueness. And I think that's a, a very important starting point. Um, that said, so from your perspective, what are the responsibilities that you would expect or associate with somebody of another ethnicity, uh, particularly somebody who's white, being an accomplice? Um, responsibility would be everything I mentioned before, but then to take that even deeper, understand what your privilege is. <clears throat> I think a lot of times when people talk about terms like white privilege and white fragility, it makes white people bristle because the assumption is I'm calling them racist by speaking to that. That is not necessarily the case. And to give context for people who may listen to this and understand it, I liken it to the responsibility me as a man has to a woman. I will never understand what a woman goes through because I'm not a woman. That doesn't deny, that doesn't mean I'm not empathetic to their struggles and troubles in our society. So I use that as a reference because then to me that says to the person who benefits from privilege, it behooves them to understand what is said privilege. Right. So when I mean white privilege, for those who are listening, imagine you going out right now and you go to a store and you can just walk in and no one assumes the worst about you. Imagine you get in a car and as I've seen videos, you can curse at law enforcement, you can call them names, you can swing. That's privilege. So how does your privilege, how can you stand up? to that. Now, let's take emotions out of this argument. <clears throat> the United States is roughly 380 million people. African Americans roughly comprise 14 to 15 percent, give or take. So even if all of us do something, there's at least over 50 percent of a population that can impact this conversation. You say, well, how have you impacted? How can it be impacted? It was more non-people of color that voted for Barack Obama than white. So that shows an awareness that there is a desire to help. That desire is a whole nother conversation. So if you really want to be my ally, you need to understand what your privilege can do, how you can impact people. How can you as a white person speak up? Well, first off, in your local neighborhoods, find out what the people of color in your in your area may need. What do black people need? In a city like Chicago, it may be different from a city like Memphis. Don't assume. Don't assume the narrative of a black person you see walking down the street. I have fun with it because I have a very sarcastic sense of humor. People see me walking down the street in a t-shirt and a fitted hat right now, and if you tell them I'm working on a PhD, they're aghast, like, oh, that's amazing. Or my favorite one, you speak so well. I had English, just like you. I've taken multiple English courses. I learned the English alphabet. So don't use microaggression and passive, passively aggressive comments to engage. After we get past that, don't, don't patronize. You know, being black is not something that I feel bad about. Like, or if the latest news thing is like, oh my God, I'm so sorry about the George Floyd thing. How do you feel? And it's like, now you've made the conversation awkward because you have now made me the spokesperson for black people yet again. So if you want to be my ally, get to know me and let's find out how we can work together because change is incremental. A lot of times people want revolutionary change, but change is evolutionary. That means it's a slow process. It's a one by one process. It's engaging people, and that's how you can help. And for me to, to not belabor the point, I've seen this with people close to me. Like my sister, for instance, who just recently became a commissioner, 
in the in Portland, Maine, aka the whitest state in the union, I've seen what happens when people work together of all colors to help other people, right? You know, and the thing about it is the last point that white people need to understand is we don't get to turn off our color. This is not a job. This is not something that, oh, okay, well, you know, all right, I'm a, I work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I can go home and, you know, turn that off. This is something that if you're going to be dedicated to it, then be as dedicated to it as the, the, the person becoming a doctor, as the person becoming a teacher. If not, sometimes it's just good to just shut up, believe it or not. Sometimes you can do a lot more help by just being quiet or just saying, I don't know. Um, because a lot of times people go in and go, I'm going to change X. You don't even understand what X is. You have no knowledge of X or your X is from a base that is so unrealistic, right? Uh, whether it's working in urban communities, even that language is toxic. It's offensive. It's a community. It's no different than anywhere else, but you have a narrative attached to it. So get to know me, get to know the person, understand what it is, have your questions ready. And then for me, lastly, admit what you don't know. It's okay. You know, one of the funniest questions I've ever had asked to me multiple times is the usage of the N-word. And this is a very sticky subject, right? So a white person who's a good friend of mine years ago was like, why is it can I not say that word? And after I got done laughing from a deep hearty place, I educated him. And for me personally, it was like the word is synonymous with something we didn't create. My father was born and raised in the South. And my dad's philosophy and some which I adapt, he was like, no, I use the word because you applied it to me. I didn't know I was that word till you told me that. And a lot of times kids, for instance, do not see race. You can put a black kid and a white kid next to each other and they're going to play. So that tells me this is progr programmatic. Someone put this in them. If two kids play right now, they're going to play. They don't know one is X or one is Y, one is black, one is that. All they know is it's a boy and a girl. They want to play. So do not add a narrative that then suits you to figure out how you are going to help me. That's the equivalent of I'm going to give you a disease. <laughs> I'm going to make you sick and I'm going to need you to come to me to get the cure. So. All that said, learn what it is that I need, learn what you can do, ask the tough questions, and then let's collaborate and cooperate to elevate. Right on, man. Um, you know, a couple of points I want to uh, explore just a, a bit with you in all of that. Um, first of all, the, the, this whole thing about white privilege and white fragility. Um, you know, these are terms that, that personally for myself, I, I didn't grow up with. Uh, they're, they're, they're relatively recent terminology that, that was created, I guess, uh, or invented, whatever you want to call it, in order to describe the, the things, the conditions, uh, or the attributes that you explained. Um, and there, I do have some concerns, and I, I wonder what your thoughts are about this. Um, I mean, white privilege kind of is, is self-explanatory. You, you, you explained that one really well. But I, have a, I do have a concern about the term white fragility, and I'll tell you what that is. Um, mm -hmm. We now live in a, a day and age, and this is a good thing in terms of our, our awareness, our discussion, our, our sensitivity toward mental health issues. It's a really important topic and it's, and it's something that a society around the world, I mean, my God, the pandemic has shown us, you know, just, just how critical mental health on top of everything else in our lives uh, really is. But here's, here's something that I have a concern about. Mm -hmm. And that is that there's an element of folks that will take things and try to turn it around and you you know you talked about sort of creating these these toxic environments and and whatnot and i have a i have a, a concern when i hear and i see the reactions of of some white people particularly um we see it with the with the police brutality issues we've seen it with what they the so-called karen episodes uh and other other you know aggressive or, or overly 
um, sensationalized episodes of, of people, you know, reporting a black person was in the swimming pool, the public swimming pool. Oh my God, you know, this kind of, ins you know, madness. But yet, the reaction from the white person is this, this, you know, hysteria and overreaction stuff, which is is the white fragility. What concerns me is that at some point in time, we're going to see that become part of the mental health spectrum. So in other words, you're going to see a situation, and I think we have to be really care careful about creeping into this. Oh, well, he shot uh, this person or injured this person or, or you know, committed some offense, but oh, he's not guilty because it, it was a mental health episode. He, he, he suffered from white fragility. I, I really, man, it really concerns me down the road. I, the things that I see, uh, looking at January 6th and the Capitol uh, attack and, and other situations that we've seen, and I'm going, you talk about slippery slopes. That's just one, and I just wonder, what, what, what are you, your thoughts about that? Oh, that's a great segue. Um, fragility in general, white fragility, and I've read the book by the lady who came up with it. Um, it's a good book. Um, for anyone checking it out, this is not a you know a promo, but I think for white fragility and mental health can be a slippery slope. But to be fair and play devil's advocate, I think even amongst people of color and black people, racism can be a slippery slope. So here's what I mean: sometimes people of color weaponize racism for their own personal benefit. That's the conversation no one wants to have as well. In the case of white fragility and mental health, and you, re you refer to the um, <clears throat> domestic terroristic attempt to take U.S. government codified as an insurrection, um, that mental health and white fragility deals with something systemic that no one is talking about on a deeper level. And here's what I mean. Hypothetically, actually no hypothetic, the year before, early 2020, a lot of people of color got to the Capitol and they couldn't even get near the front steps. All right. We fast forward to January 6th. Uh, the former person, 45, who held an office whose name I will not mention, incited a situation where a group of people felt that their way of life was threatened. Now, if memory serves me right, you are a man of military and understand terms like way of life. So when a way of life is threatened, people then do whatever they need to do for survival. Here's the irony of this. People of color, according to some research, will outnum outnumber non-people of color by 2050. <laughs> so what we're seeing in this white fragility is almost a pseudo psychological feeling of extinction. And you see this in the execution of campaigns, in the execution of literature, in the execution of narratives, meaning, oh my God, we got to take our country back. The very nature of the slogan, make America great again, is an example of white fragility. Because any person of color, regardless of where you sit on a political aisle, will ask you a very simple question. When was America great for me? If you look at historical context, when this country did well, it was built on the backs of people of color. Industry in the United States was built on the backs of people of color. World War II, soldiers came back and World War I who fought for this country and were hung. So the fragility and the mental health piece go hand in hand. However, I don't allow people to lean on that because there was a cognitive awareness and a premeditative, premeditative nature of what you've done. So, for instance, if I if I was to say I was mentally I had mental health issues and I go into a situation and shoot up a mass of people, I don't get to use that as a defense. You know why? Because a basic criminologist will say you had the wherewithal to get a rifle. You had the wherewithal to get bullets. You identified a target. You strategized and executed. You had a certain mental capacity to do this. However, with some of our uh, brethren during January 6th, it was white fragility. And it was just they were so worked up and 
they didn't mean to do this. And, and not to belabor the point, but this is a very serious issue. You literally had foreign flags in the rotunda of the Capitol. You had a domestic terrorist act. You had people that took classified See? documents. <clears throat> they smeared feces on the Capitol. <laughs> now, if I may quote, if I may quote Chris Rock about being black in America, being a black man in America is like having an uncle who paid for you to go to college that molested you. It's a very poignant metaphor. Trust me, I know what this country has done to black people, but the fact that these quote-unquote patriots who love this country so much decided to wave the loser flag from 150 years ago in the Capitol to okay. elucidate a point I, I, a lot. I got to jump in right there on that one, and I don't want to go too far off because we, we hear, are here talking about the, the concept of, of being an accomplice. However, mm-hmm. I do I, I got to jump in on this one, man, because you mentioned you know, even, even from a, a military aspect, from a historical aspect, from, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I guess if you want to call it a, a patriotic flag waving American aspect, right? How mm-hmm. in the world? How in the world can anyone justify the storming of the United States Capitol building and carrying in the Confederate battle flag into Mm -hmm. the building? Imagine, I want to rewind the clock 150-ish years or 160-ish years now, I guess. To the early 1860s and the Civil War in the United States. Could you imagine somebody marching into the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C. with the Confederate flag? Tell me what would have happened to that person at that moment. (laughs) I think we all know the answer to that question. And here's the thing. Supposedly... The Confederacy lost the war. They were defeated on the battlefield. You know, Lee surrendered to Grant, all of that. Great. So now it's all supposedly, and I say that with emphasis, supposedly all one country. However, again, over 150 years later, you have people still waving Confederate battle emblems. And in fact, I'm I'm even going to point this one out. The flag that sits atop the Georgia State Capitol right now today. Now, now I'm not talking about the Robert E. Lee flag of Northern Virginia, the one that we, we all know and recognize from the Civil War era that, that everybody you know associates with, with the Confederacy. I am talking about the original Confederate States of America flag called the Stars and Bars. You can go look it up. Okay, look up your history. It flew atop the Confederate uh, capital in Richmond, Virginia, uh, Jefferson Davis, all of that. All they did is they removed uh, the stars from the blue field and put and replaced them with uh, replaced the, the star in the center with the Georgia State seal. It is the exact same flag that was the the Confederate. Uh, na- national flag at the beginning of the Civil War. Go look that that one up. So these emblems continue to 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 be flown, to be waved, to be presented. There is a word for that. You you you're you're a man of of uh, of intellect and vo- high vocabulary, and, and and you started us off today with a definition. Well, hey, I got a definition for you. Carrying the Confederate flag into the United States Capitol building as part of an attack on that building, guess what that's called? Treason. That's what that is. So you're an American citizen, but you're waving the flag of the enemy and storming the, 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 the seat of democracy, as they call it? Come on. Just just stop it with so, that. So, so, so I mean, interject. Go ahead. <laughs> you bring up a good point, and this is why I said all of that. You asked me at the beginning, what do I want out of my accomplices? All of the gentlemen and women who were done, who did that act, were seen as accomplices to the act. I want my accomplices to defend me with the same zeal that they went into that building to do what they did. Because that means you're willing to die along with me that makes you my brother at that point because a lot of times 
And I know, again, I took that real long circuit to it is answer for a reason, because a lot of people, when it gets real, do not want to give up their privilege enough to see this situation change. I'll tell anybody, diversity is always good at the bottom of an organization. People coming in, starting off, interns, but the higher it gets, the lighter it gets. So if you're not willing to shed blood, because when you look at the red, black, and green flag, it talks about this. I metaphorically compare it to America. There's only two things Americans respect. Loss of money, green, loss of life, blood. Those folks were willing to die in a treasonous manner for a loser flag. If you're not going to fight back with that same level of, what is it called, matched force, you know, then we're not having a, we're not having a fair conversation. A lot of these conversations are, well, what can we do to change people? And you brought up an excellent point about legislation. You cannot legislate the heart of man. You cannot legislate that. There is no law. Unfortunately, this is the truth. There are people, in my personal opinion, that because they saw Barack Obama come into office January 20th, 2008, they galvanized to create this environment. Do you know how much hate that is to have because you feel your country is taken away from you. Mind you, these same people who say your country is taken away from you live the scene and do the right thing. Who's your favorite basketball player? Jordan. Who's your favorite person? It's black. Cinco de Mayo. You got on a big sombrero and you like to eat tacos and you want to send those same people back across the border. So again, my accomplice has to be willing to get it in the mud and get in the struggle. If you're not, that's okay. Do what you can. But I don't believe people who aren't willing to go into the field and do the work. Whatever the work is for you, whether it's at a legislative level, if you're not getting involved, all you're going to do is make people like me mad because people love black when it's convenient. They love black culture. They love black food. White women love black men. White men love black women. Everybody loves black until it's time to be black, if I may quote the late, great Paul Mooney. And when it's time to be black, people pull a Miley Cyrus and back up and go back to their roots. So my thing is, if you're going to be black and benefit from being black, then get all the way black. Get as black as the night. Zero dark 30. Learn my culture. If you're not going to be that black, if you're going to be warm gray, if you're going to be 70 percent. That's cool, but just know it's hard to take you seriously. So all that said, in a country that keeps apologizing for what it did, but will never overtly say what it did, but never change the mentality, how can I take it seriously as a whole? Now, individually, there are people like yourself who have proven that they are willing to be in the mud to learn and admit what they don't know. But fortunately, we have a person like you that understands and is willing to learn. But we need more people like yourself that'll go, hey, brother, I don't know. Help me understand. You know, so if you're not willing to do that, then most people like to say diversity, equity and inclusion. I take those words as jokes because the biggest benefit of those words to end on that point is white women. So until you really want to see black people evolve and as I joke with people. And I'll be very sensitive in my language. If you're not comfortable with me being your boss, if you're not comfortable with me dating your your daughter, you really don't want to see me do better. You're just doing it because diversity is good for business. Oh, man, I appreciate you so much, bro. Uh, you know, and we there's just so many different ways we can we can go. And I'm going to have to actually have you back again on, on another show to, sure. to, to get into some of these other topics that we've kind of touched on because there's just so many things. But uh, at this point, we got to take a quick break. Uh, we got to jump over to my man, the ambassador, and Bungie Garland. We'll be right back. This is the Accomplice Podcast. <laughs> Thank 
can definitely hear the unity message in this song, which is important. I mean, L. David always drops knowledge, man. It's tough to talk after him, bro. <laughs> but it's point, and it's important for people to understand that. Like, if we're going to be one family, let's be one family. So let's do it. All right. Hey, hey, just before before we get back to our guest, man, um, Ambassador, you know, like, like for real, here in Toronto where, where we're at, it's been a long road with this pandemic, man, and, and it just blows my mind because I think about all of the things in the past year and some months uh, that, you know, people have, have gone through, have suffered, and, you know, even for us here, you know, summer summertime is a big time in Toronto because it's the time Ooh, of year, weather-wise, that we can get out and do fun things, and we have all the festivals, and of course, everybody's missing Caravana is one of the one of the events, uh, but there's many many others, and you know, like the song says, we're one family, and it's. I think it's really one of the interesting things about the Caribbean, and I know we'll we'll do a show uh, more in depth about this in the future. But uh, yeah, I just appreciate you bringing you know through the music uh, the the concept because uh, if anything, this this pandemic has shown us. It's that all over the world, we're definitely one family, man. So appreciate you. Big, big ups on that. Definitely. Appreciate it. Right on. You're watching the Accomplice Podcast. I'm your host, the other brother. My guest, L. David Stewart, uh, photographer, hip-hop artist, businessman, and entrepreneur, and, of course, uh, Ph.D. candidate. Man, I cannot wait. I've been following you for the last several years on this journey. And I can't wait. I really, actually, I want to bring you back and do a show about that because uh, the things that you've shared with me over over time, uh, just about the the struggle of going through that that process is just just incredible, man. So, uh, really looking forward. I, I I'm I'm maybe looking almost as much as you are looking forward to to graduating is to see you graduate. You know. Um, so it's really, really fantastic, and, and all the best uh, with that as you, you finish it off. Um, we're talking about this concept, uh, uh, what do black people want from their accomplices? And so um, where we, we left it off, you know, we talked about some of the responsibilities of being an accomplice. If, if that is something that a person uh, who is not of, of the black community or of the African diaspora it desires to to weigh in and 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 have that kind of relationship and and have that kind of impact tell me uh, are there any examples in your own personal life of people that have been accomplices absolutely um <clears throat> one that comes to mind for me is my associate dean and undergraduate uh, an italian gentleman god rest his soul uh vincent paglione we had a nickname for him called the Godfather. <laughs> the reason we called him the Godfather is my mentor in architecture told me no matter whatever you're doing, whether you're getting A's or F, stop in to see him every semester just to let him know what you're doing. That man gave me the opportunity to graduate. If I didn't graduate then, I don't come to Toronto that following fall. <laughs> so... I've had people that have done things that they believed in me that, you know what, I'm going to help you. You know, I've had people even down to my dissertation chair, uh, me and her, when I first met, we had a very um, Tom and Jerry relationship. <laughs> uh, me and that woman, it was on site. Um, but she's been my greatest champion. And she helped me even when I was in the hospital to ensure that I got certain paperwork in and things like that so to me it parallels my life and my development parallels the underground railroad there have always been people that have been vested that have given their lives to help people of color black people and everything else and my life is no different um and i'm thankful for that because i am not here today without standing on some of their shoulders along with family friends and everything else so you know there are many people that have contributed uh, to my betterment, improvement, understanding, awareness, and sometimes tough love. You know, one of the things that we as black people forget sometimes is we can be wrong too. And we got to understand that even though racism and systematic racism and oppression exists, sometimes you just screwed up and it ain't got nothing to do with color. 
Um, the best example that I will give you, bro, is my former baseball coach. God rest his soul. His name was Chuck. He was a, a former force, force recon Marine from Vietnam. Played one year in Major League Baseball. So if you know anything about Special Forces, that's a very tough guy. I will never forget when I first started playing for him, our team was called the United Nations. <clears throat> now, he could not get away with this today because he would have been sued and everything else. He lined us all up. He called every person the racial epithet according to their background. And he said, this is what you were all thinking anyway. Now that we got that out the way, learn to work together. And when I say we did, I mean, you had the hood is a hood dudes, the backwater billies, the guys, you name it. We were a team. And that was something that I asked him one day. I was like, why did you do that? He was like, because at war, men are men. All men bleed. And you can't be wondering, hey, I disagree with you and all that. I don't care about your politics. I need to get through this moment. And for me, he drilled something in me at 14 that carries me to this day that I'm very aware, well aware of things, but I also understand people. And if you're willing to help me be better, then you're my brother. If you're not, then you position yourself as my enemy. Um, and, I, and, and learning that at a young age made me also understand uh, all skin folk and kin folk. So some of my best allies do not share color with me. Some of my best enemies look exactly like me. So people have always been there in my personal and professional development because I pursued a field where there wasn't many people and there's still not many people that look like me. Um, so I'm thankful. And it's also taught me to look at each and every person on a case by case basis. I can't assume that you were raised in X and believe in Y. And that goes positively or negatively. So absolutely, and many people have been helped by non-people of color, white, whatever. Um, even politics differ. So yes, I've had a lot of people that have been blessed to help me on my journey. Right on, yeah. And it's, I mean, and I think if there's something that I would want people to really take away from this show too is that that it it is so important to look for opportunities to help other people, to help, you know, a kid achieve their goals. Like you talked about having a coach when you're, you're 14 years old. Um, you know, we have teachers, we have coaches, we have all kinds of people that, that we come in contact with. And you never know just how powerful even a, a short period of time in your life that influence can be. Um, and and it, it doesn't matter what the, the color, the ethnicity, the religious background, gender, all of those things, if you can make a difference, if you can spark something positive in another human being, you never know what that may do on down the road that that person will, will accomplish or, or create or uh, you know how that will impact them in terms of their own self-esteem and all that kind of stuff man and it just yeah it's something that I think so oftentimes especially in North America our society is so uh, material driven a lot of times that we lose sight of that uh, we, we, we are we are often taught to think about what what's in it for me uh, what am I going to get out of this and whatnot so I think that that's that's a huge thing man and I appreciate you sharing that with us um Taking this, this just, you know, a, a little dive further than uh, moving forward. You know, you mentioned uh, some folks in your life that have had an impact, uh, that were accomplices, if you will. Um, and now you're at a certain age of, of experience and, and maturity uh, and accomplishment. Going forward, David, uh, in, in all that you have learned, what now are some of your expectations going forward in life of an accomplice? If, if, if you're going to work, you know, you kind of talked about it that, 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 you know, that person has to be uh, in the mud with you. They have to be ready to, to, to bleed with you and, and all of that. But maybe some, some specific things that you're looking for now, the, the future Dr. David Stewart, you know, 
uh, is looking for in terms of accomplices to, to network with and strategically create with, what are some of the, the things that you're looking for in an accomplice and that you would expect? What's your why? Very simple. What is your why? Um, diversity is a big business. <clears throat> Let me say that. Diversity is also trendy. So I need to know your why. Why do you care? Your why tells me things about you that you may not know you're telling me. Because, you know, right now I look at the uh, post-George Floyd environment when companies were like, oh, my God, I'm going to show that I'm helping black people and we're hiring and all these ads and all that. It's great. Your execs didn't change. <laughs> you uh, you want to help black people and you're doing all this. Great. You still didn't change your mentality. So knowing your why is the top thing that I need to know when I work with people now. And I apply that not only to this lens, but to all things, because if I know your why, then you're going to know my why then we can find out why we're working together. Because oftentimes, and I've seen incidences where non-people of color are diversity directors and they do something really racist or really overtly ignorant. All someone should have did is, well, why are you doing this? If I know your why, we can work together, even if I don't agree, you know? Um, so that's big for me. Lastly, if I know your why, I need to know your expectation of me. I think that's a fair question. I want to know what you're expecting to get from me and what you can learn from me. Because this is a, this is a, this is a dialogue, not a monologue. For us to help each other, I can't just be talking at said person like, do this, do that, do this. What do you require from me? Because if we have a dialogue, then we're having a true exchange, right? Then we can both grow and benefit. So again, what's your why? What do you want from me? Oh, man. Wow. Where do I even start? Okay. So, so a couple of points that, that I made notes on. And, and, and first of all, I want to I tell my, my co-producer, uh, Jay, uh, we, we need to do a whole show on diversity is a business, because that one right there, man, and, and, and I know some folks are going to get uh, their feathers ruffled with what I'm about to say, but would you agree with me, David? Maybe, maybe not, but, but white folks aren't the only people benefiting from the business of diversity. Is that Absolutely. fair to say? That is 100%. There are some diversity pimps that are black, that are LGBTQ and everything else that mm. really do not care about the mission that they say or espouse. And that really hurts everybody else. You know, there's poverty pimps, diversity pimps that, that you know, whoop people over the head and go, if you don't help me with something, I'm going to report you to the news, this, that, and the third. And that's not fair because there are some truly bad people out here. But there are also some truly bad people, as I may quote earlier, all skin folk and kin folk, but that are weaponizing this discussion for monetary gain, personal gain, and that hurts everybody just as bad as the overt racist. Absolutely. Well, it, and it's interesting because there's a couple of guys that comes to mind when I think about situations like Breonna Taylor or George Floyd or you know Sandra Bland, many many too many names uh to to even list uh sadly enough but it there's there's a couple of folks that consistently uh you know you think about trayvon martin is another one I, I think of uh there's a couple of folks that consistently pop up when black folks are deceased and and mm -hmm. deceased in a violent way uh and and it really concerns me because I, 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 I they're, they're very popular mm -hmm. they have celebrity status mm -hmm. you know and, and, and I'm not saying that they haven't done anything constructive ever but it always seems like the same two or three fellas show up after you're dead yeah consistently and consistently I know, who you refer, yeah. I know who you're referring to uh -huh. black and white 
and, and, um, and, and, and that's true too. I mean, of course, from a media standpoint, I mean, we don't even need to, to, to waste time on that one because we know that the media uh, takes full advantage of, of these situations for its own uh, pecuniary motives. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll stop it there for, for, for now just because that's going to be a, a whole other show. Diversity is a business. Man, that's, that's deep. Um, the, but the other thing I wanted to just explore briefly with you before we go to another break with, with uh, the ambassador is um, I really liked what you said there to, uh, in your final point, which is, you know, what is, what is it that your accomplice can expect or, or ask of you, you know, in this situation and, and that it's a dialogue. And I think that, you know, when I, when I read books like um, Uncomfortable Conversations with the Black Man by uh, Emmanuel Acho and, and I've been to trainings and I've been to events and I've you know, talked to folks about uh, some of these issues, one thing that strikes me is there, that, that I think there's a fear on the part of a lot of white people that, it is a, that they will find themselves in a one-way communication uh, dynamic. That, that, like you said, you're going to be talked at, you're going to be lectured, you're going to be told the way that it is, and even maybe a fear of asking questions, right? And I think that's something that we really need to work on getting over. Um, we need to, to make sure, like you said, is to, to be open-minded and uh, o- open-hearted, if you will, enough to be able to have conversations back and forth and understand that everybody does not come from the same set of experiences and understanding. I, I'll give a quick example before we go to the break, and, and, and this just strikes me uh, as, as a really good example in, in what you said there, because back when I was in university, I went to a, a small university, I played, played football, and there was a fellow uh, that I was on the football team with, he was a white kid from, from Idaho, I think he said there were like 100 kids in his graduating class, you know. Um, and for me, I, I, for those that don't know, um, part of my, my story is when I was in university, I became a member of the Black Student Union uh, and it was a member dur- during, of that organization during my, my time in university. And so uh, this, this young man came to me one time and, and he asked me a question and he, you know, it wasn't out of uh, uh, maliciousness or anything negative. He was really just truly curious. And he said to me, he goes, how is it that you're so comfortable interacting with uh, your, you know, our black uh, teammates and, and fellow students and, and that kind of thing? Um, he said, I, I don't really know how to interact. And I said, really? I said, okay. I think I was, I was 17 or 18 years old at the time. And I, you know, growing up uh, on the West Coast, being a, a Canadian kid and stuff, you know, you, you had all kinds of diversity around you. And this was not unusual for me. But when he explained to me that the first black person he ever saw in his life, his young life, was when he came to university at 18 years old. The only black folks up to that point that he had ever seen were on television. Um, that seems really unusual probably to a lot of people. And, and it's, it, I wouldn't say that it's most people's experience, especially nowadays, but this is you know more, more years ago than I, I care to admit, uh, bruh. <laughs> But, but in, in the 80s, okay, this is in the 80s. Uh, but, but this was, the point is, this was this individual young man's experience. That was him. And so he was approaching this subject because, to me because he saw how I sort of interacted and talked and, you know, the music that I listened to or whatever, I guess. And, and it was like, okay, well, you know, how, how did this come about? I'm, I'm curious to know. Um, I, in the context of what you just said, though, I, I, it's interesting to me because I wonder, had he gone to somebody else um, who perhaps was, you know, like an African-American person who was maybe not as receptive to his inquiry, you know, what kind of response would he got? So I think that kind of ties into what you were saying there, that it is a two-way dialogue and that we have to, to understand and come to, you know, as long as we could be respectful of each other mm-hmm. and respectful of our our, our humanity uh, mm-hmm. to to have these conversations about the differences and about the things that we don't necessarily know or understand uh, in a respectful manner. Uh, I, I think that's really important and, and 
kind of speaks to, to what you said, so I really appreciate that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to The Accomplice Podcast. I am your host, the other brother, my guest, none other than the, the soon-to-be-famous doctor, uh, almost there, David Stewart. But right now, we're going to go to a short break with The Ambassador. Actually, there's a line of bungee dropping there that I think keeps this as well. He was talking about relations between Jamaica and Trinidad and how there's a class of cultures, which kind of speaks to what we're talking about in terms of working together. You know, how David had talked about he had a coach who basically said, Look, these are all the personal political things you guys might have. Forget all that. Now it's out in the open. We got to work towards a common goal. It's the same kind of thing here when we're talking one family. We're all going to have different political individual things, but if we're working towards a better society, then that's what it is. So. Always a pleasure to have the ambassador with us, our musical director, and uh, he is the ambassador of music. He, he's bringing you... Uh, you know, the, the soca, the reggae, the Afro beats, and always a message with it uh, tying into the theme of the show. And, and I just love it, man, because music, I think, is one of those things that really brings us together um, and, and is a place where we can, as we I've been talking with my guest today, uh, David Stewart, about uh, the dialogue and the commonalities and the places that we can actually uh, link as as individuals and, and share with each other. So I think that's really important and, and I appreciate you so much, man. You, know, you, you bring it each and every week. Um, I'm going to come back to our, our guest uh, for our final segment. This is our, our rapid fire segment, man. And, and so I'm just going to give you like 30 seconds um, uh, to answer some questions here, uh, each one, and we're going to we're going to whip through this. But so so back in my day, I'm going to tell on myself a little bit. Uh, but back in my day, you know, you you had this term. I, I don't know if young people still use it, so whatever. But um, they they called cats that that sort of wanted to be down. But you know, you kind of described it earlier. They you know they want to hang out. They they like black. They they want to you know listen to the music and do this and do that. Uh, whatever, but they're not really in, in in it for real, right? Like they're not in the struggle, so to speak. Um, and and the term that we used to use was wannabe. So uh, so with that said, in in thirty seconds or less, my first question to you is: What is the difference between an accomplice and a wannabe? Go. An accomplice is someone who's going to be there with me regardless of the income benefiting them or not. The wannabe is not. All right. There it is. All right. So now I got a list of people. All right. We're going to go through them. And I, I'm going to ask you, is this person an accomplice or, an, or a wannabe? In your opinion, accomplice or wannabe? And, and if you want to take a couple of seconds to, to say why or why why not uh, or, or what, your reason behind your your choice, uh, you can you can have thirty seconds per per name I'm gonna call. So sure. here we go. So accomplice or wannabe? Rachel Dolezal. Wannabe. Okay. Uh, Eminem. Accomplice. Anderson Cooper. Neither. Okay. Okay. We're gonna come back to that one. Uh, I, I, again, this is going back a ways, but Vanilla Ice. Wannabe. <laughs> Bill Maher, accomplice or wannabe? Wannabe. Accomplice or wannabe? Macklemore. Accomplice. Accomplice or wannabe? Kim Kardashian. Wannabe. Accomplice or wannabe? Greg Popovich. Accomplice. Accomplice or wannabe? Jane Elliott. Accomplice. Accomplice or wannabe? Uncle Joe Biden. Neither. Okay. All right. 
you know what? So I got to do this because because I, I didn't really have a neither category. Um, so I'm going to go back to Anderson Cooper, and then we're going to finish this off with with just briefly in 30 seconds. Anderson Cooper, you said he's he's neither. Why why so? One of the interesting things about Anderson Cooper that a lot of people don't know is that he interned for the CIA. Okay. So he is media, and while he is a, to my understanding, a member of the LGBTQ community, it's not his, he's never dis- displayed a genuine, sincere interest or disinterest in the advancement of black people, in my opinion. He's there to, he is dispatched as, a, as needed to try to ascertain a situation to the benefit of, of his uh, employers. Okay. And last but not least, you said that, that the current president of the United States, uh, affectionately, I guess, called uh, people say Uncle Joe, but President Joe Biden, you said, is neither accomplice nor, nor wannabe, and, and why so? His role as a politician is to work with whoever is going to vote for him and be the loudest. Now, Joe has a record of doing things that hasn't been exactly to the benefit of black people. If you look early on in his political career, but he also tried to, I think, old age has mellowed him out. But Joe has not demonstrated a sincere, executable demonstration of helping black people because in 90 days he has a bill for the anti-Asian hate bill, but has not matched that with the demographic that has put him into the office. So he is a politician through and through. There you have it, accomplice or wannabe, <laughs> our rapid fire this week with my guest, my brother, uh, David Stewart, soon to be doctor. I, 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 I'm going to be so happy when I, I can drop the soon to be and just say, welcome to the show, Dr. David Stewart. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but hey, man, we wish, y'all, we wish y'all the best. I, I know you're looking forward to it for real, man. It's going to be a, it's going to be a celebration. Uh, but hey, you know, always a pleasure to, to talk with you. And, and I always truly learn something new every time we, we talk. And, and man, I'm just so proud of you uh, and everything that you're doing. Um, and and uh, like I say, just uh, with you all the way on this, this journey. And certainly uh, wish you all the best as you grind out these, these last couple chapters and defend that dissertation, man. Fantastic. Thank you. Greatly appreciate it. Greatly appreciate it. Outstanding. All right. Well, hey, this has been another edition of the Accomplice Podcast. I am your host, The Other Brother. Again, thank you so much to uh, my musical director, the ambassador, to my co-producer, Jay Harris, uh, and to all of you for listening. Uh, And of course, the one and only David Stewart. Uh, We'll definitely have him back again. And uh, thank you all. Looking forward to seeing you on the next episode.